will say about politics. And the third is what should, how should, or shouldn't Christians participate in politics? That's a lot to cover in not a lot of time together. Uh, so I'll probably talk kind of fast and try to leave some time for questions. Uh, but uh, Pastor Matt is also recording it. So if, if you really need to unpack it a little bit more, uh, you'll be able to get the recording of that. So let's start with the relationship between the kingdom of God and the United States. So we have an understanding that we have citizenship in heaven. I'll talk a little bit more about what that means uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but when we look at scripture, we see the kingdom of God that Jesus inaugurates, that so many of Jesus' parables talk, start with this language of the kingdom is like, uh, and he goes on to tell a story. We see in the final chapters of Revelation, a description of the new Jerusalem or the kingdom of God. But we live in the United States. Now, these are fundamentally different entities. Right? It's not that one is good, it's not that the kingdom of God is good and the United States is bad, they're just different. Okay? And the reasons they're different have very uh, important implications for our approach to politics. So just a couple of the differences. Uh, the kingdom of God is eternal, while the United States is temporal. Meaning the kingdom of God has no end point. Uh, there is nothing that is going to bring about the demise of God's kingdom. The ultimate establishment of the kingdom of God is certain, and it has no end, just as God has no beginning or end. The kingdom of God wasn't formed by humans, right? This is God's kingdom. God causes it to come into being, and it's not going to have any end as a result of human action or inaction. Uh, humans don't cause it to happen. Humans don't cause it to end. And because that kingdom is eternal, our allegiance to that kingdom is primary and unconditional. If we con contrast that to the United States, the United States is temporal. It's not bad. It's just the nature of geopolitical entities, right? The United States has a starting point. You learned about it in school. There was a time when the United States didn't exist as the country we know it today. And there will come a time when the United States ends. Um, hopefully that is not until Jesus returns and it's the end of time, but human-made kingdoms and empires and monarchies and all of those kinds of things, they have end points. You study history at all, you study you know, the decline of the Roman Empire, which no one thought would end, right? So the Roman Empire is actually a really apt example. Uh, the people of the fourth century and earlier uh, thought of Rome as the eternal city. Uh, they thought that it was uniquely positioned by God as like the center of the church. Uh, Peter and Paul were uh, potentially, probably, possibly martyred in Rome. It was you know, the center of Western Christianity. But then it was invaded. Right? The city of Rome uh, was conquered by the Visigoths. People fled, people died, the Roman Empire collapsed. And in that context, when that was happening, there were all these refugees fleeing Rome across the Mediterranean uh, into North Africa, into a little town that was not known for anything <laughs> called Hippo, where this bishop named Augustine lived. You may have heard of St. Augustine. Uh, and so Augustine is trying to help his congregation understand what it means that the supposedly eternal city has just collapsed before their eyes, and they've been inundated with all these people fleeing uh, from the city that was being besieged. And Augustine wrote to them, uh, he said, What are you scared about just because earthly kingdoms perish? That's the reason that a heavenly one's been promised to you that you won't perish with the earthly. Earthly kingdoms go through changes, but there will be one of whom it is said, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Why do we place our heart on earth when we can see that earth is getting turned upside down? So he is reframing their understanding, their primary citizenship, their primary allegiance is in heaven. That is eternal. Earthly kingdoms go through changes and even go through destruction. So, again, it doesn't mean the United States is bad. 
It just means it's not the kingdom of God, right? Different foundations. Next, uh, different ways of thinking about uh, pr providing for people's needs. Okay? Uh, in the kingdom of God, it operates on a theory of abundance, not just a theory, a reality of abundance. There is plenty for everyone in the kingdom of God. We get a little glimpse of that when Jesus feeds the the thousands at the various points through the Gospels. It's not just a miracle that you know Jesus multiplies loaves and fishes. It's also this teaching about the nature of the kingdom of God. The nature of the kingdom is there is plenty for everyone. If you can think about all of the problems that are solved when you have plenty for everyone, the kinds of human behaviors that just go away, <laughs> if you're not worried about basic needs being met, that's part of the reality of the kingdom of God. But it's not part of the reality of the United States or any other country. That's just not how earthly economies function. Uh, countries, geopolitical entities, operate on a theory of scarcity. Right? We assume, rightly or wrongly, that there isn't actually enough for everyone. And so that determines prices, that determines a lot of human behavior, uh, that can inspire generosity or it can inspire greed. It just depends on the, on the person and the circumstances. But the reality is that earthly economies function on the fundamental principle that there isn't actually enough to go around. It's, again, not necessarily bad, it's just how earthly economies function. That makes it different than the kingdom of God. Uh, and then we have that the kingdom of God is universal, where the United States and other countries is boundary. So by universal, I don't mean like universalism, like everything's equal and all paths lead to God or something like that. What I mean is the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. Right? So God is the creator of all that is, seen and unseen. And so God's kingdom, the realm over which God is sovereign, doesn't have any boundaries. So you don't say, okay, well, God's sovereignty ends here, and on the other side of that, someone else is in control. No, God's in control of the whole system. That's fundamentally different than any country, right? We have borders. We have boundaries. And uh, when those boundaries are transgressed, that's e either colonialism or invasion, right? We, wars are fought over protecting countries' boundaries. The nature of earthly countries having boundaries is not a bad thing. It just is reality. It's a way of ordering society so that it's not just chaotic or anarchistic or something like that. But it's a difference with the kingdom of God. So we have these fundamentally different things. You have apples and oranges, right? They serve different purposes. They have different foundations. Uh, we also see different values between the kingdom of God and the United States. And sometimes this can be tricky because the values can use the same word but mean different things. So take freedom, for example. This is a word that we use in the United States, and it's a word that we use theologically. So in the kingdom of God, freedom means freedom from sin and freedom for others is the way freedom is framed throughout Scripture. Where in the United States, when we talk about freedom, most often we mean individual autonomy. Individual autonomy isn't a bad thing, but it's a different definition of freedom. It's a different value, and sometimes those definitions get conflated. Or the word with the United States definition of freedom gets assigned to the kingdom of God's definition of freedom, and these get confused in ways that they shouldn't be. You also see power. In the kingdom of God, we see power exercised through the humility of Christ. Right? Power is made perfect in weakness, and that's a very counterintuitive thing because in the United States and any other country, not unique to the United States, we think of power in terms of the ability to coerce people. Coercion isn't always bad. Coercion can just mean motivation. Right? But part of the role of government is to use its power, its authority, to prevent people from doing some things and to get people to do other things that are necessary and helpful for society to function. But the way it does that, the way government does that, uh, has to do with things like 
threats of going to prison or things like that. It's just part of how societies function. Not a bad thing necessarily, flawed systems for sure. Uh, but it's different definitions of power, different ways of thinking about what power is and how it should be exercised. You also have justice. Uh, we talk about justice in scripture, we talk about justice in the United States. In scripture, in the kingdom of God, justice is defined by God. We look to God to understand, okay, what is justice actually? In the United States and any other country, we have all these different competing definitions of justice, right? Different uh, social groups, different political ideologies all compete with each other to say, no, this is what justice is. No, this is what justice is. This is what we think it means to be just, but one person's justice can be seen as another person's injustice. Uh, so we can get confused about that as well when we take an, a, a human definition of justice and say, well, that's what justice means in the kingdom of God. So we have these words that we use in both describing the kingdom of God and describing the United States, but they mean different things in different contexts, and it can become problematic when we kind of conflate those earthly definitions with those heavenly definitions. So if we have this kind of foundational understanding that the kingdom of the God and the United States are fundamentally different things, that could lead us to think, well, okay, my citizenship is in heaven, I have nothing to do with the United States, I have no obligation to government, like I'm just gonna back off, kind of ignore the world around me and just try to live as a kingdom person with no connection to the world at all. That doesn't really work very well, right? We're, we're in a part of the country where uh, people try, like the closest you can get to that is isolated communities like the Amish or things like that. But even that requires some degree of interaction with society. Uh, and so the question becomes, all right, if I am a citizen of the kingdom of God and a citizen of the United States, how am I to understand the connection between those things? If they are so different, then how do I straddle that difference faithfully and well? So, you with me so far? Okay, I know I'm talking fast, sorry. Uh, so, we'll move on to the next question, then, and then we'll come back to this kind of details of this interaction. Uh, what does the Bible say about politics? Right, we are familiar with uh, politicians quoting the Bible, um, or even us, like you know, looking to the Bible. What does the say, Bible say about X, Y, Z, whatever the significant issue is that we're concerned about? I'm not really focused on that. Uh, th there's a place for that, certainly, but I'm really interested in what's the big picture. Uh, what the Bible does and does not tell us, uh, and so some things that the Bible does not tell us about politics. Uh, first of all, the Bible doesn't prescribe specific governing structures. It doesn't prescribe a specific form of government as the one right form of government. Uh, so monarchy versus empire versus democracy, like all of these different types of governments that exist. We see in scripture a lot of human governments failing you know, monarchy turned out bad. Uh, the judges who were supposed to exercise God be like the intermediaries between God and Israel in the book of Judges and earlier, they're a very, very mixed bag. If you've read the book of Judges, it's positive and inspirational. No, it's not. <laughs> it's kind of depressing. The whole thing is a cycle of it got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And so we don't see in Scripture an explanation of this is the ideal form of human government. Uh, and so that, I mean, maybe it would be helpful if the Bible just told us, like, this is where we, the way you should organize yourselves, but it doesn't. Uh, the Bible was written in a particular time and place. It depicts the political systems that existed at different times, but it doesn't prescribe one or the other system as an ideal. In Exodus, we have something like a theocracy, sort of, with Moses and the Ten Commandments and all of that, but 
Christians are not a ethnic group that all live in one location. Christians are scattered by definition. So the idea of having a single, like literal government that organize the life of all Christians it just doesn't work in reality because Christians are scattered all over the world. The Bible also doesn't function primarily to spell out platforms or policies. Sometimes this happens, sometimes we can turn the Bible into like a bullet pointed policy agenda. And it's like, okay, here's a position, here's a Bible verse, here's a position, here's a Bible verse, here's an issue, here's a list of Bible verses. That can be instructive, it can help us think through what do we as Christians think about a specific issue, but the inverse can happen where we reduce the Bible to just being a political platform, and that's, that's just not what it is, it's not what it was written to be. So the purpose of the Bible is not to tell us what party to vote for or what position we have to have on a specific policy issue, it certainly shape and should shape our thinking about parties and policies, but that's not its primary goal. It doesn't lay out how convictions about particular issues ought to translate to law or to policy and help shape our thinking about that, but it doesn't just spell it out for us. Uh, the Bible also isn't addressed directly to the 21st century United States, right? So. The human authors of scripture didn't know that this landmass existed, right? God did. Uh, but it doesn't show up in the Bible. Um, it's not addressing the world that we live in. It has implications. It shapes us as the people of God. But if we take a Bible verse and say, oh, that's a Bible verse about America, that's a faulty hermeneutic. Hermeneutics is just biblical interpretation. When we hear people say, oh, this is a verse about America, Kind of back up a little bit. Say, well, it may have implications for our understanding of America, but America is not the original audience. So, for example, uh, one verse that gets quoted a lot in political context, Second Chronicles seven fourteen, says, "If my people who are called by my name will humble humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal from, hear from heaven." And I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. So sometimes Christians use this verse and say, this is a call for the United States as a country to turn to God. We might understand it as a call for all Christians to turn to God. And certainly we would love for all people in the United States to submit their lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and turn and worship God alone. But a geopolitical entity does not do that. People do. And this verse is in context about dedicating the temple. And so Christians don't have a land. Christians don't have a country. Christians aren't a nation. Christians are a scattered people and not the same thing as the Israelites of the Old Testament. So we have to think through how are we using the Bible to talk to the United States today? And so what do we do? That? How can the Bible help us? Uh, well, a couple of things. One is that the Bible gives us more guiding principles than it does proof texts for specific things. There's a whole lot of things that we deal with and question in 21st century America that simply didn't exist when the Bible was written. Right? We're, we're not going to find a verse telling us uh, which contemporary political party uh, is the right one, or how to use technology well, or whether AI is a good thing or not, right? It just isn't talking about that, but it does give us some really helpful principles for thinking through politics in a much more broad sense. Uh, so the first of those principles is that our citizenship is in heaven. Right? So we, if we understand those differences between the kingdom of God and the United States, then we can start to think through, okay, what does it mean that my citizenship is in heaven first? So Philippians 3.20 says our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So because our citizenship is in heaven, that relativizes all of our other loyalties. Right? Our loyalty to any country or family or city or anything else 
has to end if it comes into conflict with our primary loyalty to the kingdom of God. So there's limits around other citizenships because of our primary citizenship is in heaven. Uh, another principle that scripture is very clear about watched Israel be conquered by Babylon and like everybody get carried away into exile and now they're trying to figure out okay we're Hebrews we have our own land what does it mean to be the people of God in this land scattered among these people who don't worship God and Jeremiah writes to them and gives them uh, this advice uh, in 29.7, he says, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Uh, the word there in uh, where it says peace and prosperity, the Hebrew word is shalom. Uh, so you're familiar with that idea, not just of peace as absence of war, but peace as wholeness, everything being right, the well-being of the city. So if we think of ourselves as Christians, as being in a sense, exiled uh, in this land that's not our true home, in which there are a lot of people who do not worship the God who we worship and would be more than happy for us to stop worshiping the God that we worship. Our posture is not to kind of bury our heads and pretend the world doesn't exist or to treat uh, the place in which we're exiled as our enemy, but to say, okay, this is where we are. This is where we live. We share this city. We share this town, this county, this country with other people. And so we can seek the well-being of this place where we're located. Because we as Christians are only going to do as well as the cities that we live in now. Uh, and politics is a big part. Uh, governing structures, laws, policies. That's a big part of how well our cities and our counties and our countries function. We, we benefit or not uh, from how well our whole community is doing. Uh, another principle uh, comes from Romans 13, and it says, submit to authorities unless, okay, because our allegiance is relativized, because our primary citizenship is in the kingdom of God, not in the country, our default position regarding uh, civil law is that we follow civil law. But when that law comes into conflict with our responsibilities as citizens of the kingdom of God, then that shifts. And so in Romans 13, Paul is actually writing to Christians who are questioning whether they have to follow civil laws at all. This is his audience. They're like, oh, well, we're free in Christ. So we are no longer under the authority of civil government at all. We can do whatever we want. It doesn't matter. We don't have to follow the law. And Paul is like, mm, no, please don't be anarchists. That's not the function of the church. He's actually encouraging them, like, be good citizens, be model citizens, even. We see this play out for the early Christians as well. And so he says, as, as you're... Your default posture, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. There's no authority except that which, has, which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. We can unpack that for days and weeks. It's actually really complicated. But at bare minimum, our default posture is to say, yeah, we respect the authorities that are in place. Whether we agree with them or not, we respect their position. We're going to follow the law. We're going to be good citizens. Unless following that law would require us to do something that puts us in conflict with our kingdom citizenship. And so we get the contrast in Revelation 13. Now, Revelation 13 uh, is the chapter that talks about like the mark of the beast and stuff. I'm not going to get into all of that. 
Um, but the audience for the book of Revelation is Christians who are suffering under severe imperial persecution. And uh, John of Patmos, the author of Revelation, is encouraging them to persevere under persecution and telling them the people who do not uh, follow the beast, who's a symbol of the empire, um, they're the ones who are going to enter into the kingdom of God. It's, it's just this call to kingdom faithfulness, to being loyal to God alone. Um, and so in Revelation 13, it says, in part, the whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. Right? So everybody, like, latches on to this imperial government and follows it as if it's God. And John is saying, the people who don't do that, who aren't deceived by the claims of government being, being God-like or having the same level of authority or power as God, the ones who persevere in not worshiping government but worshiping God alone, they're the ones who will be marked as faithful uh, in the end. So we, we get these principles. Right? It's not about you know, which party, and it's not about where do you stand on a particular policy, that, that matters, but it's big picture. What's the relationship between the kingdom and our country? So there are more places from scripture that we can deal with. Um, I deal with some of them uh, in the book, and there's more. There's lots of books on scripture and politics, some of them really good, some of them really not. Uh, but uh, that just gives us some framework for thinking about this. So then what do we actually do? Well, general principles are lovely. I'm a pragmatic person. Um, I might surprise you from a theologian and a historian, but I actually like concrete action steps. Uh, and so what it means for us, this bigger question, how should we or how shouldn't we participate in politics? All right, so a couple of uh, big picture principles for how Christians can and should participate in politics. One is that we have to be informed. And that's harder than we think. Because we have information, we have disinformation, we have misinformation, we have deep fakes, we have uh, kind of the memification of information. You get kind of a bite-sized image that makes uh, a, a hyperbolic, kind of scary-sounding claim, and then it gets spread all over the internet, and you can get to a place where, like, I don't even know what I'm supposed to think or what's true or what's accurate or how I'm supposed to figure this out. But as kingdom people, as people who follow... God, who is the final arbiter of truth, we have a moral Christian obligation to traffic in truth, to traffic in accurate information, not in lies, not in fear mongering, not in scare tactics, but say, okay, what is actually true? What is actually accurate? Uh, where are we getting our information? How is it forming us? What is it making us think? Uh, is reality, and also what is it causing us to think about other people? Because the news we take in forms or malforms our love of neighbor. A lot of news is really intended to tell us who we need to be afraid of and who we need to be angry at. Fear and anger are not fruits of the Spirit. And so we need to be looking at, okay, where are we getting our information and what is that information doing to us? Um, one not foolproof, but helpful source of that. Um, this is just a screenshot of it. Uh, it's the media bias chart. Um, this is from Ad Fontes Media, but if you Google media bias chart, you can find this. Um, this website takes maybe not every imaginable news source, but uh, newspapers, uh, cable news, podcasts, websites, all of these different places where people get information and it maps them. And so at the top, it has just reporting information without commentary. And at the bottom, it's just commentary, not concerned with accurate information at all. And then from left to right, it's political ideology. So the left 
um, is the left-leaning political ideology, and the right is the right-leaning political ideology. And there are methods for how they map this out. It's all on the website. It's not foolproof, but it's one of the better tools we have out there. And so it's interactive. You can go in and type in like your favorite podcast and see where does this person actually map um, on this chart. And so if we're wanting to have accurate information, we need to know the leanings of where we're getting our information. That doesn't mean we don't ever get information from sources that have political leanings. That's impossible to avoid. But we want to try to stay at the top and center of the chart as much as possible. Because those are sources that are primarily interested in sharing information, not just opinion, not you know, getting a bunch of people at a table and then watching them yell at each other for an hour, um, not inventing information. The lower you are on the chart, um, the more uh, removed the news source is from standards of journalistic integrity. Um, and so they don't have an internal commitment to sharing accurate information. They're perfectly fine with just making stuff up. Uh, and so walk and find stuff completely made up, untethered from reality, or a little nugget of truth that says spun, 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 until it's unrecognizable as truth. Uh, so if we as Christians are going to be engaging responsibly as kingdom citizens, as disciples, of the truth himself, then we need to be people that others trust to share accurate information. Uh, that people know I'm not just gonna you know, spill stuff out and get riled up about something I heard on a podcast or that I saw on social media and then share it, but then I'm going to say, huh, that, that sounds a little bit off or that's using language that seems intended to make me scared. Maybe I'm gonna go look up what they're talking about. Maybe I'm gonna chase down that document, uh, see what that source is, see if it actually is what they said. I spent a lot of time, or I spend a lot of time reading uh, just law codes, which I'm not great at. Um, that language is not like normal <laughs> language. Maybe some of you are lawyers or something and you can understand it, but I'll try to go and go to the actual like state code and say, okay, what does this actually say? Or, you know, download the actual PDF of Project 2025 and read what it says. Like, it's right there. Uh, so we can actually check these things out and not share disinformation and be formed and malformed by that information. Uh, another uh, aspect of our engagement with politics uh, is that we should be salty. Now, I don't mean salty in the sense of, like, using salty language or uh, salty like, um, you know, just kind of disgruntled and unpleasant to be around, right? Uh, what I mean by salty is that we need to be the salt that Jesus tells us we are, right? So Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, right? He doesn't actually say you are called to become the salt of the earth. Says you as a Christian, you are. That is your identity. You're salt. And so, uh, what does it mean to be salt? Well, salt adds flavor to things, right? That's important. Uh, salt is a preservative, especially in Jesus' time period. So, okay, if we think about that in terms of politics, as Christians, if we are being salty in politics, we should be adding the missing flavor. And that flavor should be an improvement on what was already there, right? Uh, sometimes you go overboard with the salt and you know, overextend the metaphor. Uh, but when you taste something that's missing salt, you notice that it's missing and you go get some salt and you put it on there, right? Christians in our political engagement ought to be bringing that missing ingredient so that you as individuals in the ways that you engage with politics, if someone is having a conversation with their family or their friend or their neighbor about something political, they're like, you know, I really would like to hear what you have to say about this. Like the, their perspective, not their, not their opinion, but the way they engage with politics, that's the missing ingredient here. That would make this conversation better if they were a part of it. If you were a part of the conversation, it would be better. It would be more edifying. People would come away, even if they disagree, thinking, 
that was a really helpful conversation. I'm glad I've had that conversation. I want to keep thinking through these complicated issues with that person. So we're adding something that's missing. We're also part of preserving the common good. We're not trying to burn it all down. We're actually trying to make the world a better place. That's part of our Christian witness. I, if we <coughs> contrast that saltiness with a blandness, a Christian who is bland in our political engagement would be a Christian who is so uh, formed by political party allegiance that they're just a political partisan who happens to say, oh, and I'm a Christian. I go to church on Sunday, but really the thing that people know about me is I'm a Democrat or I'm a Republican or I'm voting for Kamala or I'm voting for Donald, Donald Trump. Uh, like I, they don't necessarily know what I believe or that I've submitted my life to Jesus Christ, but they sure know who I'm voting for. And they know that I'm not going to say anything bad about that person or negative and that I don't have any substantive critique about the party that I tend to lean towards. We all tend to lean toward the party. Nothing wrong with that. That's just being intellectually honest. Who's like, you know, I tend to be more liberal. I tend to be more conservative. That's fine. Uh, we would say in that progressivism or conservatism, we're so formed by that that we can't even find something to critique about it. And we're bland. We're not adding anything missing. We're just conformed to our political party. And we're discipling people into that political party, not into following Jesus. But it's fine to have a political party you affiliate with and kind of explain why I think that's okay in the book. Uh, but if in our party affiliation we are completely blind to the reality that a political party is not the kingdom of God and is not bringing about the kingdom of God and is not fully aligned with kingdom values, then we've replaced the gospel of Jesus Christ with a political party platform. That doesn't do anything good for the mission and witness of the church. So with those things in mind, we can take a few different approaches to politics broadly. Uh, and so the subtitle of my book is 10 Approaches to Christian Citizenship and Why It Matters. I'm obviously not going to try to explain all 10. That would be crazy. We'd be here all night. Um, but I want to highlight a few of them. Um, because since the United States and the kingdom of God are fundamentally different things, and say no one political party is going to fully align with the kingdom of God, and so Christians who have the same faith convictions can come to different conclusions about not only party politics, but the relationship itself. What does my faith call me to in the political realm? So one of those approaches uh, is a separationist approach. We think of this in terms of separation of church and state. Uh, the idea being that the church has one particular job in the world, making disciples, there's other ways we can articulate that mission, and the state has a different function and they operate independently of each other. And that's more complicated than it sounds. <laughs> of course, I uh, but it's the theory behind the First Amendment, right? The religion clause of the First Amendment, uh, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or limiting the free exercise thereof. All right, so what actually is establishment? What actually is free exercise? It's what the Supreme Court has always had one over. But the underlying theory is that government is good and serves a function, and the church is good and serves a function, and they're different. So the government is not in charge of the church. We don't have like an official government religion, right? Uh, and the church also is not in charge of the government. The church is not trying to establish a theocracy. These are different things that operate on different principles. And so uh, for Christians who elevate that separationist approach, uh, they can come to different conclusions based on their Christian convictions. So for example, uh, you could think uh, of a hot-button issue like abortion. Right? So in a separationist model, uh, for some Christians, not all would approach it this way, but for some Christians they might say, I oppose abortion on religious grounds, but because it's a religious conviction, I don't think it needs to be 
like the law of the land, so they'd say I'm personally pro-life, but I'm politically pro-choice, that kind of distinction. Now for some Christians, hear that distinction, say how, how, can, how can that be? How can you possibly say I believe this is a Christian, but I don't think it could, should be the law of the land? Well, because that's a different perspective on the way that politics and faith should intersect. But this is one approach deeply rooted in Baptist history and Lutheran history, especially. I, I'm going to skip pluralists for the interest of time, so just skip to the next one. <laughs> They're kind of related anyway. Uh, another approach, and these are actually mirror images of each other. The pictures are not, but the analogies <laughs> are. Uh, one is the social gospel. Um, so in the 19th century, there was this big movement for reforming society. It kind of was birthed out of the abolitionist movement. We're like, okay, as Christians, we think slavery is bad. There's a war. Slavery is abolished. It's a little more complicated than that. Uh, but that reforming mindset forms into this social gospel. It says, okay, the structures of society ought to be reformed so that the United States operates more like the kingdom of God, especially in terms of economic justice, racial justice, uh, equality between men and women, those kinds of things. And so the social gospel sets about trying to transform really public justice, uh, especially during the Industrial Revolution. So there's a whole lot of like wealth inequality that develops in the Industrial Re Revolution. The social gospel says, there's a problem here with the way society is functioning. The economy needs to be transformed. Labor law needs to be transformed. Uh, this is where we get things like a 40-hour work week and the abolition of child labor. Um, is from people saying, this does not reflect the principles and values of the kingdom of God. So today, that kind of mode of thinking, uh, we see most in mainline Protestant churches, um, the United Methodist, Presbyterian, USA, Episcopalian, like they tend to be uh, influenced by the social gospel, though not always. Um, also, uh, the African American Christian tradition um, across the United States, their activity in the civil rights movement is a prime example of that. Um, some strands of Catholicism, but not all, Latin American liberation theology. So there's different kind of ways that this way of thinking about social reform as a Christian responsibility, different ways that looks. In today's political uh, kind of bifurcation, those uh, aspects of reform or those focal points of reform tend to be associated with progressive political ideology, but their origins are in a, a certain vision of Christianity and what scripture calls people to. And then the mirror image of that uh, is direct Christian influence. It's not really a technical term, but uh, it's the best I could come up with to describe it. Um, in direct Christian influence, it would basically be saying that because this is a Christian conviction, I believe that it ought to also be the law of the land. Uh, that God has set forth certain laws, certain ways of ordering our society, certain uh, moral standards, and so God knows best, right? And whether other people acknowledge God or not is kind of beside the point, because for the good of society, what God says is good and right ought to be what the law says is good and right. And so Christians would say, okay, for the sake of the common good, we need to be uh, passing laws and having government structures that is directly informed uh, by the Bible, by Christian principles. Uh, Same-sex marriage is an example. Uh, so for Christians who take this direct influence approach would tend to oppose um, legal same-sex marriage, that kind of thing. Say, okay, well, looking at scripture, this doesn't appear to be what God desires for society, and so it shouldn't be legal. Uh, in contrast to some who espouse the social gospel would disagree about that, or some who have a separationist perspective might say, well, I personally have this faith conviction, but I think the law doesn't need to be determined by my faith conviction. So if we look at all of these approaches, we can say, okay, they can lead to really different conclusions politically. 
but they have the same foundation saying, I'm Christian. I affirm, uh, in some cases, even the exact same moral values or faith convictions, but I have a different way of thinking about how those ought to inform government. So hopefully, say, when you have uh, a Christian friend or a Christian neighbor who you know shares the same faith convictions, like, how could you possibly think X? Well, it might be because they have a different understanding of the relationship between the church and the government, not because they're a bad Christian, uh, not because they're not actually taking scripture seriously, but because they take it just as, script as seriously as you do and then think a little bit differently about the way that that translates to political engagement. So these and there are several others who would say you can be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ and think in these ways about the relationship between the United States and the kingdom of God and about how my faith convictions transform or uh, manifest in my political convictions. Now I think there's also uh, unfaithful ways of engaging with politics, ways that are incompatible uh, with the kingdom of God, and one of them that I'll highlight is Christian nationalism. This is kind of a buzzword right now, right? Like, it's it's kind of everywhere. It didn't used to be. <laughs> um, it's kind of nice when it wasn't everywhere. <laughs> uh, it's become such a buzzword that it's one of those terms that's almost lost all meaning, and when you hear people talk about it, especially in, uh, like, in news media that doesn't necessarily get written by sociologists who kind of study this, professionally, um, or even by religious people, it can kind of end up sounding like direct Christian influence. Like anyone, any Christian who is referencing their faith in any way in the public sphere is automatically a Christian nationalist. That's not the case at all. That can be just direct Christian influence. Uh, but here's what Christian nationalism is. Uh, Christian nationalism is the idea that America, as a nation, is a nation that is by and for Christians, and that people who are not Christian are not real Americans. Now, we have to redefine Christian. In Christian nationalism, Christian does not mean professing faith in Jesus Christ. In Christian nationalism, Christian does not mean, uh, I believe, the Bible is the inspired word of God. It doesn't mean that I believe God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean that I believe in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. Christian nationalism is indifferent to Christian doctrine. What Christian nationalism actually cares about, Christian within Christian nationalism, means two things. Uh, the first is Christianity as a cultural heritage. Specifically, Christianity as a Western European cultural heritage. Uh, so it's a set of ideas, a set of values, a heritage that has its origin in Western Europe that is therefore white and Protestant. Uh, that's nothing to do with being Christian. Uh, and so say, okay, our goal, the goal of Christian nationalism is to preserve a certain vision of a culture uh, an identity, a value system that is indifferent to Christian doctrine, that is focused on Western European heritage, and would therefore identify anything that isn't Western European descended, uh, racially, ethnically, religiously, etc., as not being truly American, and in its most extreme, as needing to be expelled from the country. Uh, the other piece of Christian nationalism uh, is morality. Christianity uh, means morality. Now, Christianity certainly has moral requirements and moral implications, but those moral requirements and implications arise out of our submission to Jesus Christ as Lord. Okay, the, the moral requirements of Christianity only make sense because Christ is Lord. They don't really make cultural or scientific sense on their own. And so uh, the morality part of Christian nationalism tends to focus on individual autonomy. Let's see, um, it's individual autonomy as a moral value um, and things related to sex and sexuality. 
Uh, there's all kinds of complicated reasons for that, uh, but that's what a Christian is. A Christian is someone who has this heritage. A Christian is someone who has this morality. It doesn't actually matter what they believe about Jesus. It matters that they have those things. And so uh, a, a, an example of Christian nationalism being just about morality is uh, the group Turning Point USA. They have these big rallies, they have these big revival meetings, pastors go to them, um, and some of the speakers are atheists, speaking to pastors, because they don't actually care what the gospel says, they care about Western European cultural heritage and morality. You don't have to be a faithful Christian to believe those things. You actually have people who are parts of other religions who support Christian nationalism well, this is kind of our identity as America. So uh, Christian nationalism is not just I'm Christian and I care about politics. Christian, Christian nationalism is a political approach to Christianity, not a Christian approach to politics. It's not Christian in any meaningful, biblical, doctrinal sense. Uh, and so for that reason, it's incompatible with Christianity. Uh, so that's that's a lot. Uh, I am happy to answer any questions. There's a whole lot more I could say, but I want to honor all of y'all's time, and you're probably getting hungry at this point as well, so I'm going to give you all a chance to eat. Um, but I, I explore all of this in more depth in my book. Um, that is a shameless plug for my book. I have copies. <laughs> uh, if you're not registered to vote, I'm a fan of voting. You can do that there. Um, and information about how to vote in Indiana and, you know, absentee voting and all of that kind of fun, sometimes complicated stuff. That's what that QR code is for. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Yeah. So Christian nationalism uh, maps onto the far right politically. Not just the right, but, but the far right, the fringe right. It's, um, this is happening globally. Uh, Christian nationalism isn't the only kind of religious nationalism. There's Hindu nationalism that's very influential and violent in India. There's Shinto nationalism uh, that's causing a lot of uh, violence and, and issues with extremism in Japan right now. So it's not a uniquely Christian thing. Um, but it tends toward authoritarianism, and so authoritarianism is on the political right of the spectrum. Um, so for that reason, I think that the direct Christian influence approach uh, can veer into that because of that desire to see Christian uh, convictions directly inform politics that in itself is not Christian nationalism, but it can make Christian nationalism look appealing because of the very direct and authoritarian way that those Christian names can be implemented. on what happens to your ability to communicate clearly when your heart rate goes up. 
Uh, and so if, if your heart rate is going up, like this is, this is actually marriage advice, but <laughs> it applies to everything. Um, if your heart rate is going up and you can, you can tell if your heart, your heart is racing, you're feeling that tension, you're not going to be able to communicate clearly. And so you need to be aware of kind of yourself and be like, okay, I'm going to take, take a moment. Um, calm down if the conversation is getting heated. Uh, the next thing is, I think, assuming the best about other people. We, we have been trained by the kind of viciousness of political rhetoric and uh, media rhetoric and all of that um, to view people with whom we disagree as not only our opponent, but as our enemy and as someone morally inferior to ourselves. I go through some of the data on this, the way people think about, you know, if I'm a Republic, Republican, it's not just I disagree with Democrats on these points, it's I think Democrats are bad. Uh, and so that's disturbing and ungodly. Um, so you have to uh, literally retrain your mind to believe the best about people. Think, okay, if they've come to this conclusion, there's a reason that they have, and I want to understand that reason, not just try to talk them out of it. Now, if you're not actually in a place where you want to understand the reason, then that's a sanctification issue. Right? This is, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step back, I'm going to, you know, keep, keep growing in my own ability to even have the conversation if I can't engage in it um, in a way that's going to be edifying. Uh, I think the other really big thing is asking lots of questions. If someone is genuinely willing to engage in a conversation, asking questions can be really disarming. Someone's, you know, on a rant or whatever, just throwing out comments, you're like, tell me more about why is that something that's so important to you? Like, do, do, do you have an experience with that that can help me understand where you're coming from? Um, and then that builds trust, builds the ability to say, like, okay, this person's actually willing to hear me out, not to just stonewall me. Um, and so in that building of trust, you can get to a point saying, well, can I share with you why I see it a little bit differently? Uh, and you, you might, some conversations that it doesn't work. Right? And sometimes there is some, like, okay, this is, this is someone that I'm just not going to be able to talk about politics with, at least not now. Uh, but I think if we can take that posture of humility, not assuming that I have it all right anymore than they have it all wrong. Well, that's what I think I always find str mm -hmm. I struggle with is we, in America, are allowed to choose. Mm -hmm. So why, does, why is there always a need to change my mind? Mm -hmm. and, and like, you yeah. know, that's one of my biggest struggles is what, you know, I'm, I allow you to believe what you believe and you choose what you choose, but you don't need to change me. Mm -hmm. and, let, and, and, you know, I, I, I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, but, but that's where I see my biggest struggle is. I don't want you to change necessarily my opinion. I want you to believe your opinion and you choose as you choose, but I don't know how to engage that person to say, I don't need you to change my mind. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think it depends on the reason that we don't want our mind changed. Um, I think, like, I have, I have very settled, what I think of as settled opinions about a lot of things. Uh, but I can also say I could be wrong. So if that, I don't want you to change your mind, it's from a place of like, I don't want to have a conversation that is rooted in you trying to change me. That's one thing. If it's, I'm not interested in hearing a different perspective, that's a different thing. Um, but I think it all comes back to relationships. We're called to love God and love neighbor as ourselves. And so if the focus is not on how do I protect myself from the conversation or how do I not, or how do I uh, convince someone else of something, but how do I demonstrate the love of God to this person and how do I strengthen a relationship with this person even within a place of disagreement? That's not always reciprocated. That's what makes it so hard. Like the posture we bring to something can be very positive and not at all reciprocated. And then we have to you know, go through the difficult process of forgiveness and figuring out what the right kind of place for that relationship is in our lives. Um, but I think it is appropriate. If someone's just like, well, you have to think this, you have to think this, just arguing, I think it's okay to say this conversation isn't helpful to either of us right now. And so I think it would be good if we either change the subject or if we part ways for today. I think that's a perfectly appropriate kind of thing to say. Mm -hmm. 
Well, the pizza smells good. <laughs> Folks have set it up. Um, would you like me to pray for us? Yeah, please. Pray for our meal and for our time. Lord God, we thank you and praise you that you've called us to this time and this place, this community, even this season uh, in our country. We pray that, pray that as this food nourishes our bodies, that you would also be nourishing our souls and preparing us for all of the good works that you have ahead for us this evening, tomorrow, into the weeks and months ahead, that we would be your salt and your light we ask in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.